You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Subscribing to our podcast on iTunes is the best way to support our show. To those of you who are already subscribers, we thank you. And to those who aren't, we thank you in advance. And yes, we still love and respect you. On today's show, we're going to be talking with photographers Ben Lowy and Marvi Lakar. Both of our guests started as photojournalists and both continue to expand their work into the wider realm of editorial, advertising, motion, and advocacy photography. Did I mention they're married with kids? Two boys, to be exact. And while we will talk about photography, Marvi and Ben are here to talk about life as photographers and even more specifically, life as married photographers raising a family. We're going to ask them about how they balance life as parents and marriage partners with the very demanding realities of being working photographers, but mostly we're going to talk about collaboration, whether it be official and credited or the kind of collaboration that happens behind the scenes within any marriage. But first, Al's Gearhead Pick of the Week, drum roll. This week, we are going to tell you about the Yongnu, that's Y-O-N-G-N-U-O, pronounce it any way you want, Yongnu, and ready for this? Take down notes. YN686EX-RT, lithium TTL speed light for Canon cameras. Now, you know what speed lights are, and, and all the manufacturers make it. Well, this new unit, it's right now it's only for Canon ETTL and ETTL2 compatible units. It has a guide number of 197 at ISO 100 at 200 millimeter. Zoom range, 20 to 200 millimeter with 14 millimeter coverage when you drop the diffuser. Just like the big boys, the head rotates 180 degrees left and right and tilts from minus 7 to 90 degrees up and down. You get high-speed sync, first and second curtain sync. It can be used as a wireless master with slave TTL functionality at 2.4 gigahertz. And here's the big deal with this thing. No more double A's. This unit has a rechargeable lithium-ion battery with recycling times as fast as 1.5 seconds, and depending on whose notes you look at, up to 600 to 750 flashes per charge. That's pretty big stuff. Okay, why is it such a big deal? It's $165. That's the big deal. So well, it's actually a pretty impressive unit for a very impressive price. And if you're looking for a TTL unit right now, only for Canon, again, that's the Yang Yu, however you want to pronounce it, YN686EX-RT. Are there other uh, lithium ion batteries? I, this uh, is the flashers? first one that I know of. Everything know else runs on double A's. So this is pretty this is pretty cool. That extends a lot of uh, what the, the, the unit could do as far as uh, play times and recharging and all that stuff. So there you have it. I feel uncomfortable being a Sony artisan. You advertising a Canon, Canon only flash <laughs> on, while I'm here. I, oh, I'm just <laughs> this is the way we work on our guests. Very right? <laughs> slowly, we start with the gearhead pick of the week, and then we work it from there. They're mm. gonna slowly convert you back to Canon. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I, I, I don't. I, I don't <laughs> think it's in our best interest. <laughs> just think a year from now, Ben, you could be a Yang Yu ambassador. I, I actually have some Yang Yu <laughs> products. Oh, wow. oh, okay. I think you're the first. Four of the same. <laughs> Their flash receivers are actually not so uh, bad. Yeah. yeah, they actually make some pretty neat stuff, and it's yeah. all very affordable. We've been talking with Ben Lowy, but you haven't even introduced him yet. Ben is a photojournalist, editorial, commercial, and advertising photographer with experience in conflict, sports, underwater, and seemingly almost every other possible type of photography. Ben's work has appeared in national and international publications, and his commercial clients include American Express, Tiffany & Company, the United Nations Foundation, and The Daily Show. Ben is also... Here we go. Drum roll. A Sony artisan of light. And that's no small accomplishment. Marvi Lacar is a photojournalist and documentary photographer, as well as an editor. She has covered domestic and international news and features stories for print publications like Time, Newsweek, Stern, Parry Match, and the New York Times. She's also a documentary filmmaker and the founder of One in 20, a mental health initiative aimed at educating and destigmatizing mental illness through creative storytelling. Let's talk, let's start by talking about how you guys met, uh, at least initially, and did things change much in terms of how you both worked once you started 
being together. Do so you this really? Is, this no, 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 you know that that's the only way I to think survive. That's from a Karate Kid. I, I, I think yeah. that's from Karate Kid. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> By the you way, know. if you're into martial arts, you know when someone throws a punch at you, or tries to, throw, you don't resist. You right. Go you go with, with it. it. So you go with you, it. So she. Okay. It, yeah. So I'm gonna preface. However, she said we met. Like the story of our meeting. It it gets better every time she retells it because it's a chance for her to stomp on my heart. Oh, I can't that's believe basically. That. I can't yeah, believe I that. Don't have a heart. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's John. That's I don't think we is. need a script moving forward. No, we'll just let him go. Let you him know, go. I, I, what were you working on? What were you working on whenever you guys met? I wasn't working on anything. Oh, I was no? actually a student at Eddie Adams. We're oh, one. Of, we're okay. one of the few well, marriages. Okay, that we, no, met okay, let's Adams. we met at Eddie Adams. I think uh, there were two marriages. No, 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 no. We didn't meet at Eddie Adams. Well, we sort of met. Saw him. She didn't like me at Eddie Adams because so, I was really full of myself, which I totally admit. I don't anyway. know. I, I never got into Eddie Adams. <laughs> so you never got into Eddie Adams. So, th- which prefaces why right. he acted the way he acted. Anyway. No, so, wait, wait. You went to Eddie Adams, but he didn't, but you met he, there. Was he like delivering lunch? So, I on? will tell you what oh, he was ooh. doing. Oof. So, <laughs> yes, I was delivering the bagels. He was the bus boy. <laughs> So I I was there and I was very serious about, you know, making good pictures. Um, and then there was this kid who went in there, a really young guy, because um, I'm much older than Ben, uh, who went in. And he was very, very cocky, very loud, very cocky. And he, for some reason, had a lot of females surrounding him. So I said, you this know. This is true. This is true. Only because it makes you look good. It does. Anyway, so he decide, or so I decided, you know, whoever that guy is, I'm not gonna go anywhere near him. So I avoided him. <laughs> um, and then the next day, he was on a panel. Uh, I was fascinated with the person I heard. And then fast forward, like three months later. Um, I was on, I am, I, for some reason I was shopping for agencies and I met his best friend at that time who was an insomniac and I'm an insomniac. So it was like four in the morning. I was on IM with this guy who was his best friend at the time. And he decided to open a chat room. This was AOL, you know, when we had chat rooms. Mm-hmm. And then a- apparently AOL? What's that? was in, um, where yeah, were you? Where Iraq. you were in Iraq. And yeah. so we ended up just having this conversation and everybody had left. And it was just me and Ben. And he was just really just cocky and and, and then I still didn't connect that the guy I saw was the guy I heard. Oh, uh, interesting. And then the guy I was on IM with, and the guy I was, so the guy I saw, I was just appalled. The guy I heard, I was fascinated with, and the guy I was on IM with, I just kind of had like this, I didn't know, I didn't know how to read him. And so he's like, I'm coming, you know, from Iraq to Haiti, but I'll be in New York for one day. Do you want to meet? And I said, fine. So we met at a Starbucks in Union Square. I think it's still there. No, it's gone. No, well, it's gone. It's actually, it's our meeting place is not a Starbucks anymore. It's, um, it's like an eyeglass store. And uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. And I, <laughs> oh, God, so bad. That was a bad joke. <laughs> anyway, so so that's that's what it was, and it wasn't until I started talking to him that I realized that that was the guy I heard. And people ask me, you know, how I reconcile all those feelings of like just being love. Just love does it. Mortified. Love by, wins every time. <laughs> <laughs> just. Love. Just love. Yeah. But we still have a love hate relationship. I it's think. more like a hate. Hate, hate, <laughs> hate, 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 hate. But wow. you love hating love each other, yeah, yeah. so it works out fine. Right, right. <laughs> you need to have a foil. But then you were right. you were off for an assignment right after that. You were in New York for a day. When when did you I'm get, the Kramer to her sign. When did you guys get back and when did you let's say I think so he was bored. Work? He called me because he was just I, bored. Well, I mean, when I came back from Haiti. Yeah. I think the whole time I was in Haiti, I was like, should I go back with my ex girlfriend or with this new girl? whose name I don't really remember. It's something like Marvin. Um, <laughs> uh, no, and and yeah, we just started. I just want to send the voice record home with you guys. Yeah, right. Just send it back, send it back in another week. Just no, it's, another it's just awkward. It's, just it's awkward it's silence. <laughs> it's awkward silence once we leave. Like, what are we talking about? Like, <laughs> right? And did you guys work together 
before you really became a couple or was there well, any? When we, we started dating, you know, I, when we started dating and I, I, I hadn't, since I was in Iraq so much, I, I didn't really have a place. So I just kind of like had most of my stuff dumped at her apartment. But there was one time, I think there was a building collapse on like, what was it? Nine, on the upper um, Broadway. West side. It was Broadway. It doesn't matter. And 96 or something. A big building collapsed right across the street from those movie theaters. It was like nine o'clock in the morning. We both got a call. One of us got a call from from New York Times. And I, I got, got a, a call from New York. You got Times. a call from New York Times. I got a call from Getty. I don't even, you know, and we both like. You were got the our, Corbus at that time. Or sure. Corbus, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and then we're just like, who's going to get the shot? Who's going to talk their way up to the Neither other part? Neither one of us got the yeah, shot. Yeah, no, but it, it was just, it was, it was just uh, like a fun, you know, and I was like, that's awesome. And I actually He has also, very fun memories. I don't have the same memories. When we memories, were covering the, R, the RNC in, in, what was that, like July, uh, July of 2004 in New York, we were sitting having uh, – like lunch with a couple of friends and and uh, like right by one of the protest parades and someone had lit one of those giant floats on fire. It was like the only violence that happened there. And I said, and I literally, it was, it was like, and I just like immediately left her. <laughs> like, I mean, I just ran, went straight to it. And she was like, that was awesome. Cause you didn't care. You treated me as an equal. And I was like, yeah, I totally treated you. <laughs> I just Is wanted that what the picture. I, said? I, know, yeah. I don't think that's yeah. what I said. I um, said I think I what that did you, foreshadowed now what do you remember our saying? altar. That I, I, think, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I think that foreshadows our wedding and me at the uh, altar. Was, like Ben oh, just disappeared. No. But there was a great, great <laughs> scene of the protest in front of uh, Fox News, where a couple of protesters had chained themselves to the streetlights, like half naked women, like dressed like Statue of Liberty, or I don't remember what it was. But we were all pushing. Everyone was pushing. And there are always fights between video news guys and stills guys. There, there's always this like yeah, those video guys are mean. Yeah, and there's like elbows throwing. And so there's all the whole the whole line was moving. And like I'm big enough that like I and as like a you know born and raised New Yorker, I I know how to I pride myself on moving through a crowd in the same way I do on the subway. And I like get myself to the front of the line and I just kind of like have my camera up and my <laughs> elbows, elbows out. out and I kind of have like my face on and like Ron Haviv is like right next to me and he gets like pushed into me and I fall over and I fall right into James Noctua and James falls over right oh, up from Harvey. But he doesn't see her because she's so short. So there's this video that's shot that, like, you see Noctua turn and, like, look around. Where? And then looks down and there's Marvy. And it, <laughs> photographer dominoes. Yeah. <laughs> I, that was awesome. I will always remember that. Hmm. It was actually kind of hot being um, hot. Working, working together in those Oh, my God. I swear situations. you romanticize all of these, <laughs> like, not fun moments. I got to ask you a question now. Like, you, childbirth, you, really hot. That no, was awesome. You, you guys obviously have a very good relationship. As bizarre as it might sound. <laughs> no, you That's are, because I'm new. watching you guys. You guys are like, yeah, you, you're definitely two very different, strongly independent people. And I'm saying very hard-headed, too, I'm sure. Yeah, like okay? I'm sci-fi, she's fantasy. See, that's where, <laughs> you know. <laughs> how, how did, now, obviously, okay, so you have this personal relationship going on and stuff like that, and you, there's, there's give and take and everything else. And How does that affect you as professionals? Do you, do you have the same interchange and the same way of being with each other when it comes to professional assignments and stuff like that? I mean, the personal banter and, and play and everything is one thing. What I about professional? Okay, I would say it took a few years to really um, do it smoothly, to really know when to step back. Like, that is his strength. But, um, now we have figured out, you know, Ben's really great. And t technically, Ben's really great at the, the bigger picture. I'm really good at details. I'm really good at emotions and and... And Ben is great at composition, finding light. Uh, we we've just we've, figured, we found, we've we, we figured found out our how to do it smoothly they, and when to step work. back. And and to just, I think a lot of it has to do too with being non-judgmental with yourself. That's really not true. learning. She's always judging me with yours. I said with yourself. Oh, okay. I can judge you <laughs> as much as I want, but I can honestly just be an adult about it and say. You know what? When it comes to gear, Ben's just a gearhead. I'm gonna step back and let him sort that out. Or yeah, she doesn't even know what young you is. <laughs> yeah, you know, I thought that was a girl who you met. That <laughs> um, I'm really good with 
storytelling and, and creating the narrative. So Ben gives that to I'm me. I'm really good at packing bags. <laughs> yeah, so she I don't really packing. It's important. Really yeah, it's important. Yeah. It's all stuff. about rolling. But there was a long time then between <laughs> when you were already married and you're both working before you had kids. I mean, the kids. Yeah, we, yeah, we, eight. we, How old we had now? seven or eight. Uh, yeah. Well, the, so, the oldest one will turn eight soon. Okay. Um, so there's yeah, a good five was, years where you're working as a married yeah. couple, but you were, Separately. We had our you were able to do your own here. things. You were yeah. able we were to go away, no issues. I'll see mm-hmm. you in a month when well, I come we did, back. And we did our, okay, our, right? our first, um, our first kind of work together in late 2006, early 2007, where Marvie started shooting her project on, uh, FGM in, in, in Kenya. Mm-hmm. And she, um, yeah, and she directed it and, and took the stills and I just shot video under her direction. And it's probably the you know the beginning of the end of, of my independence as a man. Um, <laughs> where I started <laughs> taking direction from Mark. And I, but I, you know, as the child of a, 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 a divorced uh, my parents were divorced and um, like I, I saw and I think I learned early on that the only way to keep a marriage working is you have to have one of the partners have sort of self-awareness of compromise. And Marvy does have not that. have that. And I had to be mature yeah. enough to say, I like, that's how it works. You're going to have two people and you come together. One of those two people needs to have some self-awareness about compromise. That's the only way it works. And I was serious when I said, like, I'm, I'm a reed that bends. And I think I knew that because I saw how my dad was and I saw how my mom was and they hated each other because neither of them were willing to bend. Um, and I was willing to bend. And I think the only way our marriage has worked um, is because I have seen what I need to do to keep it going because I have that self-awareness. And I'm not trying to put myself up above Marvie, because she's very firm and that's really important. It's really hard for me to buy a pair of sneakers. I always tell this story that like, it's hard for me to go to the store and say, I'm going to get these Nikes. And then I'm like, well, let me go to another store, a Foot Locker and a Foot and like try out all these different, you know, comparison shop, you know, because I'm not just firm and decisive in those things. And Marvie is, and she brings that to the table. Like, this is what we're doing. This is, this is the babysitter we're using. I mean, and I'll like, Falafel about falafel about falafel about you know like like I'm not sure about this babysitter. What about that babysitter? You know, and I'm the same way. That's um, that's you know similar to my dynamic. My okay, yeah. So so when we uh, I knew that like eventually we would have kids, and and the, the dynamic of our relationship would change, and I knew that someone in the relationship who had to take one for the team, which is you know. Obviously. No, it wasn't the woman who had to. No, no. I, I mean you did. Give you did. Birth. You had to give birth, and and it was going to change the dynamic of Marvie's, uh, you know, her career. Her career. You can just say that. Yeah, career. no, her career. And so I made the decision if she wanted to do a personal project, I would support that, and like that project was personal. I I have never done a personal project that someone wasn't paying for, that like out of our own funds, because I said that's for this, and, and Marvie's project had to come first. And I also knew that like. I will always only ever do projects that editorial or commercial clients will fund. I won't take money out of the Zyber fund. I won't take money out of the fund that we have because that's not right. Cause that's going to engender sort of uh, a bitterness in my partner that I'm running off and doing something while she's back at home with, with our kids. And I think it's still a thing that, um, uh, that we always struggle with because we're both in a creative industry. It's always a thing that um, we'll have to deal with this, this idea that, that, you know, one of us is doing something in the industry, maybe while the other's not, while the other one's taking care of the kids or Marvy has, you know. Is this fair? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean. This is like fair. I mean, you know, sure, (laughs) but I don't think it is, um, I don't think it's a unique story. I think it's, uh, no, no, but I think we're we're a couple very, that has two jobs. It's even more than that. It's like we don't have a schedule yeah. in the same sense oh, people yeah. have. There's no nine to five. Um, so that probably th- th- there has to be a lot of discipline. But when you're also we're documentary photographers. So there's a bit of serendipity and meandering that comes into the work that things come across. You're not forming and shaping them. If I had a studio and I had models coming in, I think that would be different in the sense of how we work than if it's like, I have to go away to shoot the story or I have to go walk around the streets. I don't know what time I'm going to be home. Maybe when the sun sets, but I'm not sure because I don't know what I'm going to see. And the fact that most of the assignments that we'll always ever get are going to take us away 
in the house. Um, I think I, I think the resentment was just how stark. So you do uh, admit the, there the, is resentment. Of course Finally. there's resentment. I never not admitted it. I mean, you hear it every day. <laughs> I know. I feel it every day. Too. Um, no, but I think a lot of it is because my life changed so drastically and his didn't. You know, I didn't at I, one I, point. I, my no, life no, no, changed no, 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 drastic. No, no, I had kids. This is okay. That Okay. okay. Everyone. <laughs> oh, ben, kids. okay. What I'm saying is I'll that give you that then. <laughs> ben continued to photograph. And he says, oh, you know, I just did assignments, but I didn't do personal projects. But he is still in the space where he is creating. Um, I and agree. Cre- and, and the idea of creating is what kind of brings you that, you know, that fire, that life. And that just in an instant shut for me completely because I didn't have the space to even to even see to even think about seeing um when your your day is filled with minutia you know what to feed the kids how to change them making sure they don't die I mean that was really what it was for me for a good Couple of years. I mean, by couple, I mean, yeah. several ma- times. Ma- how many All times? Right. Three. And so I, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine, and I said, "I don't think I have it anymore." You know, I saw some photos um, on the New York Times the other day, and it was these guys, these photographers who were. I think I think the article was about photography and poetry, and there was this one photo that Tad Heisler took of his son, and it was. Mm-hmm in beautiful light and the sun was just you know holding us back and looking to the side and it was really beautiful very simple photograph and I said to myself you know I said to my friend I see that all the time but for some reason I'm not seeing it I'm not seeing it as a picture and as a photographer and I don't know if I can see that anymore and she said she said something that made sense she said Todd Heisler gets paid to spend the day to see that and when you're not in that space you're not gonna see sure, right. because you know it's, it's training your brain to think Absolutely. differently and and that made sense not not you know obviously like it, these guys are great photographers um but there there is an argument there to be said that that Absolutely, no, it's, like, it's, totally like, it's, it's, it's like it's like being a basketball so player. Anything. If you're practicing so every day, you're gonna be great. So, so that's yeah. where when Ben, you know, talks about, uh, you know, like I haven't done anything creative. I haven't done any personal project. Like my blood boils because here I am the entire day just taking care of these kids. Which I love my children and I love being a parent, Dude. but I miss. I miss that other side of me because it was such a stark identity shift. Right. Um, Absolutely. And like, you know, and, and, and I understand how sometimes, sometimes I'll say things that might annoy the crap. I mean, most of the time I'll say things that will annoy the crap, but you know, at the same time it was like, I, I, you know, trying to make ends meet all of a sudden as you know, a family that only had one breadwinner, I, I, and I felt like a monkey. I felt like the little brass monkey that was just like whenever a client would call and say, go do this, I'd say, yeah, sure, I'm going to go do it. And it was nothing that I was interested in. And it was just like me trying to use whatever tricks in my bag to make an image uh, of nothing that I wanted to do, not the reason I became a photographer. And so that also broke me down in a way too, because I felt, yeah, I'm out there making images and I'm practicing. But I'm not. If you want to use the basketball analogy, I wasn't playing the position I was meant to play. I was, I was, I was, I was a filler. I was like the sixth man in, you know, just trying to do whatever the coach needed. And it, it, there was, there was nothing to it. So, and 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 so I think we both found ourselves in a place where, like, we were just surviving creatively, but we weren't necessarily happy. So thriving. so so yeah. let me interject because I feel like we sound like we're these little whiny brats. That also was temporary. I, I, I want to emphasize that for, for the parents and the couples that are out there, that there's a few good years where you are in the thick of it and it feels like that and it feels like you feels will like never see the, the next what's behind that wall. And I remember talking to my friend. And, and all she of a sudden said, those kids can make their own breakfast cereal yeah. and pour the milk in. When they start talking yeah. to each other, they start playing together. And we also were, or at least I, as the person who was at the house 
more than Ben, really tried to raise them in a way that would help me. So even at seven and six, they fold clothes. Like they <laughs> they, work, they yeah. fold their clothes. They put away clothes. You just got like a real Filipino. They wash dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're so, already you know, mowing yeah, mowing lawns with all the neighbors. <laughs> they make breakfast. Let me ask you though, okay, hands. let's just say assuming that that period is maybe coming to an end and, and there's going to be a new chapter, which is a phrase I, I know I've, you were. I've, I see it. I do see you think it. you'll be a, a stronger photographer because of it? Do you think? Someone did say that. I mean, that's the reason why I started, you know, my Bone Tired Mama Instagram um, page because it really was a study on on how I see things differently. That friend of mine that said, you know, Marvie, you will really um, – you you will come out of this phase. She said that you will come out of this phase a better photographer because you will see things differently. Mm -hmm. Your perspective of the world will change. Um, and it does. I, I mean, I see everything through the lens of a parent now. And also in, in, in a more personal mm -hmm. way um, because every person, every subject is someone's child. Um, and I think it gives you more empathy as a photographer when when you approach things that way. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm assuming as someone who really um, gravitates towards documentary, I'm hoping that that makes me a better, I don't know about photographer, I, I don't want to use that word, but storyteller. Artist. Um, Maybe not. I, you know, what's interesting is, you know, as an artist, and I, I probably – put myself more as a photographer and an artist than, than, than a photojournalist now. Uh, in, in just the sense that I, I like going across the spectrum, not just doing documentary work. Um, but it's, it's all about self-expression. So it becomes all about yourself and ego in many ways because your work is an expression of yourself. So when people like it or don't like it, Oh, when you get critiqued, when you're a gallery show, when you're in a museum, when it's published, whatever the thing, how people feel about your work actually comes back to you personally in your heart. But there's, it's not about pride in that sense. It's about an ego more than, than the it. And what I think is interesting is with kids, you want your kids to be proud of you. It's not just about the work. It's about you want your kid, you want to be proud of your kids and you want your kids to be proud of you because there's this, it's a very different dynamic than just, you know, photo editor liking work as much as you want, you want, you know, your children to think you're cool in many ways, but as a, as a parent, as a, as a friend, um, I mean, I think one of the things that, that changed me and why I, you know, really consciously decided not to do conflict anymore and to do other adventure type of things and swim underwater is because like, my kids think that's cool. And they think like I'm cool and they want to do that with me. And that's, I don't want to go swimming with great white sharks with a photo editor. But I, I've never <laughs> really thought of it that way. I don't really care whether my, my kids are proud of me or not. I, I want but them maybe to that's see, not the right word. But I like, don't, you know, I want them to see meaning and passion in what I do. And I want them to be able to translate that for themselves as well. I don't necessarily feel like I need them to be proud of me, to, yeah. to worship me. No, no. I, I want them to look at what I'm doing and understand that that meaning and passion is what fulfills me. And I hope that I can teach them to live life like that, to live a meaningful and passionate way. And maybe that's a route towards happiness, right? Last like, year we... we um, and this is part two of the, the legacy project that we did was we went to the Philippines and um, our eldest son, Mateo, uh, and Marvi and I went uh, swimming with whale sharks. And it was kind of this idea of introducing our kids to kind of this new phase in our life and then also doing it with them. And they he held the camera in his hands and shot part of the video, um, like the footage of, of him and like these giant animals. And um, that's sort of amazing, this idea that, you know, we went from like being solitary, Marvie working in the field or me working in the field and conflict zones and um, to making it a family kind of experience where we're in the field together. Yeah. I want to share things with the people I love. Like when it was just me and Ben and he was away and I did something cool, 
he was the person on my yeah. speed dial and yeah. tell him, guess what happened? Um, I was number one on her favorites and, list. And, and that, <laughs> the only one on her favorites <laughs> list. And, 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 and that, to me, I think it was the motivation for starting to do this work that incorporated the kids. Um, because it wasn't just coming home and saying, guess what, kids? Like, this is what we did and showing mm -hmm. them photos. We actually had the opportunity, the resources, the funding um, to to share it with our kids. And what better way to teach them um, than actually having them physically be there and having that experience with us. It's, it's, it's almost like happiness. You know, when you're so purely happy, you want to bottle it and share it with everyone. It was kind of like that for me. Let me jump back a little bit. Can you just talk about how your dynamic was working together? Uh, maybe before some of the, you know, that comes with the years of marriage and kids and things like that. The way my mind works is that I run, um, it, it's kind of, I, I run s uh, five, 10 scenarios laterally. So everything is going in my head, right? And so when I say, this is what's happening, and then it's like, well, I don't know if this this, this ha happened. What if, what if this happens? What now? I've already ran all those scenarios, scenarios in my head. So when I say this is what we're going to do, that doesn't mean I did not at all entertain everything else. And it's the same thing with editing. This is why editing with him, it's like seven hells, mm. you know, because <laughs> he will say, no, but what about this? And what about that? And so after about an hour of re-editing, so I have my edit, right? And he changes it. And but this is your work, your photos. Or his? His. his. Okay. When he comes to me with mm -hmm. an edit. And he'll rearrange it and he'll think about it and whatnot. And in the end, after five days of this re-edit, he comes back with my edit. And he's like, that looks good. And I okay. cannot, because he has to go through the process. Yeah, yeah. But for me, I've already done that in my head. I already had like 10 different edits in my head. And so when I come onto this edit, that doesn't mean I didn't entertain anything else. But can you work the same way on your own work, though, on your own photos? Um, I, th I, I believe I've had. I've never really... It's much easier. It's much easier. Like, I've, she's not good at editing her own work. I, I, Most people no, no, are not. Yeah, it's not, because you're emotionally connected in the same exactly. way that... I, and I've always, I, I mean, the same thing she's talking about, oh, laterally thinking, and I've thought up every day. Like... Whatever that just was, like I do the same I exact it. thing for her in the same way. I'm, 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 I'm not as um, intellectually arrogant about it. I'm, I'm thinking about arrogant. my the lateral thinking of the chess match of your photography <laughs> and let me your knight to my He's queen so bishop seven point seven. No, it's like when she shows me a pattern, like that one works and that one doesn't. I, I just say it in a different idiot. way. <laughs> How long are you guys together now? Oh, my God, too, too long. long. Oh. <laughs> and you've come a long way, you say. Yeah. That it's <laughs> fascinating. Them. Okay, we're going to take a short break. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's pretty funny, too. And we'll come back with Marvie Lacar and Ben Lowy. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Okay, we are back with the newlywed game and uh, <laughs> our newlywed couples here. <laughs> anyway, John, you want to ask a question? Why don't you take? But it? you guys still, you still turn to her for your edits. I mean, obviously, uh, you have an I, editor. I would actually do, say but, yeah. I will show her the finished products because I want to show her something. Um, but I don't like go through and say, "What do you think about this? What do you think about that?" Because um, but there are also I mean, some boundary it, it, it issues. Yeah, you know, there, like it that, depends. I, I, well, I have so to say that there are some boundaries. Yeah, I mean, there, kids, and, I mean. and when you're working together, you have to find those boundaries, and that doesn't that comes with that comes with time. That comes with figuring out what works for you and what doesn't. Um, for a long time, it was okay for me to um, see all his raws because I had. You know, I was working and I was doing all my, you know, my own work as well. And there was something for me to physically look at and and attach to my own identity, right? But then when I was at home taking care of the kids and Ben would come back and he would say, hey, can you do these raws? There was just so much resentment that came, that built from just the act of being his editor because all of a sudden, like, I get relegated to just this. Like, I don't get to shoot anymore and I'm just this person who is helping him 
in his career, even though that wasn't his intention, I translated it as that. Um, that's what it meant to me. So, so it has changed, and it's changed because of the circumstance. And again, I want to I want to remind the listeners that you know we're not. I, I don't want to sound whiny or bitchy about it, but these are the realities that we had. We're definitely not in that. In no, that and place and I anymore. think I, I you know I think our relationship as husband and wife, our relationship as, as, as best friends, because I think that's also really important. Um, and, and our relationship at, at, as, um, teammates, uh, um, you know, in, in, a, in the photography business, you know, that's all evolved over time and it will continue to evolve as, as, as we grow, as our business changes, um, you know, and, and, and as way, we change and, and as, as people, and as we change sure. as people. Yeah. So, uh, so I, you know, as kids grow as um, new chapters start. I mean, you know, like I, 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 you know, as a duality of things, we kind of split stuff up where, you know, I'm like the physical one. So when we're on assignment I'm Marvie, the cerebral and Marvie just saunters down with no gear on her shoulders and I'm carrying like 17 Pelican cases yeah, on my I'm head. Yeah, but I'm the one thinking of the story and formulating. We're co-directing a lot of TV commercials. Everything that in, in advertising stuff, is, we, we is do together. together yeah. Because um, it makes sense to right. do things together. Editorially, um, it's not It's not really editorial, how do you divide? Do you divide it simply like that? He does all the... The lug work and you do all the thinking, or not really. I mean, how no, do you how I, do you divide I, I, it? I, mean, no, no, we I think we understand. We, you what both have cameras. Are. You're both shooting. Yeah. We're both, both shooting. shooting. We okay. both we bring a different dynamic yeah. to the table. I mean, some things as even as simple as I'm six one and she's four ten. Sure. There's uh, there's yeah. a perspective that's different. Um, she brings her her perspective as a woman. I bring my perspective as a man. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to push the limits of what I can do creatively and physically, where Marvy will not go physically out on a limb in the same way. But those. You know, I also tend to like overlook something I've done before that might have worked, whereas Marvie will be more sometimes more conservative in her approach where it where it works compositionally. And because we have those two different dynamics working, is when we approach a situation, uh, we're able to accomplish more. Uh, just also, if you're able to keep your egos in check, which is something it's difficult for creative types to do, what you actually have is a very good formula because if you could just check everything that goes on with your ego at the door and walk into the assignment as, as a team and knowing that each of you have your own strengths, that just makes each of you that much better. And well, it makes, makes, we, you can do well, your job that we much We recently better. did a, a commercial. It was a rebrand. We had a rebrand for AOL. When, when AOL was uh, um, became Oath, became Oath, and 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 so we we had a soundstage in Atlanta, and we were working with our production uh, our uh, production company uh, Pogo Films down there, and we had this big soundstage that had like a lot of different actors playing different roles. And when it came to the really boisterous, like we had to have a sports fan with face paint and a big bald guy, just like me, just like screaming, cheer, like that was me being the wrangler there. I didn't make the images. Marvie had the camera in her hand, was shooting, and I was there getting hoarse, screaming, trying to get this guy to cheer and the way, you know. And then when we had like a more quiet moment, a more cerebral moment, where one of the characters was supposed more to be emotional. like the Huffington Post kind of reporter, kind of, you know, in a different scene, Marvie was leading the way and trying to direct how this actress should should do these things. And like I was behind the camera. Mm -hmm. And we we understand intrinsically how where our strengths are. And there, when we're there, on the, there on was, the set, I, I, I we must, can do that together. I must admit that I was kind of surprised, pleasantly surprised by you at you know at that job because um, it was heavy on interviews, and I am the stronger person when it comes to. She interviews. makes a lot of people cry. Out of our last, you know, probably fifteen interviews, she's made about eleven people, and just brought them like tears, brought them to no, tears. No, no. She's a manipulative woman. <laughs> um, <laughs> emotionally, no. she I, I know, I know, and I know how to connect with people. Let's rephrase. Do you know that. I'm going know home alone from the NHS. <laughs> Ben will be sleeping in, in a hotel today. Um, no, but um, and so on the call sheet. The road sheet, to Jersey is paved with good intentions. On the call sheet, um, it actually said on the interview call sheets, it actually said cinematographer Benjamin ben. Lowy, mm -hmm. director Marvy Lacar, mm -hmm. and he. I have no pride in that. That doesn't matter to me. Like he was fine, fine with that. No, um, I. It, it, you know, that, I, that I, I know a couple. That, I, I would say that that's growth on your part. When there's like a big scene, 
where we were directing like five, you know, fake doctors. I actually think some of them are real doctors in front of this giant board doing this scene. Like I went in there and I mean, I do remember Marvy being, you were a little annoyed that I just went and was like, okay. And I'm like, I'm this orchestra and I'm like trying to be the conductor and like get everything. But I am just, I have a, on set and I know in, in just life, I just have this loud personality where I'm always like, okay, let's do this. And like, it's very different from Marvy's approach. He's like, okay, you know, mm-hmm. let's set this up where I'm like, so I felt like for that scene, that was my thing because I could just command everyone's attention in the entire yeah, space. But are you guys at the, at the stage now where let's say after that moment where you just had that big moment, do you need to get back and talk, huddle with each other and say, don't regroup. do it that way? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Or, 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 or oh, no, you just, no, no, no. If, if that bothered Marvie, which it did initially because we took a lunch break like and we talked about it, she can come to me and say that bothers me and say, okay, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about. Because fit, with, I mean, with these kind of um, situations as well, it affects how the crew looks at you. Sure. And I remember one time they we walked in and the, my assistant, my assistant cameraman, Um, because we had, you know, we had two cameras, so he had his assistant camera and I had my assistant camera and the guy who was my quote unquote subordinate was like, um, Hey boss to him. And then he looks at me, he goes, hi, sweetie. Um, well, I can tell you something right now. It just, there's certain human natures. Okay. You guys walked into, I've never met you before. Okay. Like you're six one. Okay. You got muscles and tattoos. Okay. You I'm glad you Mar- noticed. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I work out. <laughs> and Marvin, you are the complete opposite. You are petite. Okay. I'm 4'10. You're 85 four- pounds. Yeah. Okay. And you know what? You really do have to assert yourself more when you walk into a room just at a pure human nature. Okay. Mm-hmm. You have to flex a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And and I guess you really do have to sort of like maybe. And right. then when and, you're and partner- it's also where we're learning. We never worked before right. with giant crews. So, so the dynamic of when we work on our own in the field is very different than when we work with 25 people. Right. So that's like a learning process for us, for me, say, okay, I need to act differently when we're working in the field co-directing when we have a giant crew right. because I need to see them. He needs to th- watch I need me. them to see me respecting Marvy well, so that they can. Mm-hmm. And and that mm-hmm. and, and again, that's a learning experience. And you have to be mature enough as an individual. And I don't think I would have been able to do this in my 20s in the same way that I can now. Right. As, as I, and I like, remember we have to there be was mat- And Marvy would never have been able to talk to me on the side 10 years ago in the same way that she does now. I think so I, would there, have, I would have carried that to the end of the day and then just taking it, out, know, taking it out. Let me ask about assignments uh, when they come in. Are you, I mean, obviously you were saying that you're doing, you're, not, you're doing less or, or no conflict work now, but you are doing work, uh, both of you, that can put you in danger. Do you talk about assignments when they come in and, and make the decisions together yeah. as to whether you're going to um, do them? So, so we're very strategic two, About two with years ago, I was asked to do, um, to go cover the Ebola mm-hmm. crisis. Mm-hmm. And we spoke about it at that point, and we were like, well, you can do it, but maybe, you know, I think it was for the Wall Street Journal, they were like, can you, you know, and I went back and said, can you guys get me a separate apartment for like three weeks when I come back? Because I don't want to like come back and go straight home Mm -hmm. where I have kids. And, you know, they said like, no, we can't really do that. And I was like, well, then I, I, you know, I don't think I can take this assignment. It's not, you know, so I, you know, and that was when we spoke about it. And, um, like when uh, Caleb, our youngest son, was born, he was born on May 25th. And Marvie went into labor on May 24th, about uh, an hour after uh, Tim Hetherington's memorial service, who um, was a photographer who was killed in Libya. And May 25th, the day that Caleb was born, is actually the death anniversary of Robert Kappa. Mm-hmm. And I remember in the hospital, I'm like, this, this is a lot of omens right here. And I did go back to Libya, um, you know, a a month later, uh, for the fall of Tripoli and for all the fighting afterwards. Um, and we actually had a really long, really long discussion about that. Like, do I, am I keep on doing this work? And I, you know, Tim had emailed me the night before he died. Chris, uh, Hondros had emailed me the night before he died. And, and, uh, and, and Michael Brown, who's a dear friend who was injured, in that um, attack had also emailed me. And all three had emailed me because I was, I was supposed to go back and join them. And, and, and I felt really strongly about going back. 
And it was, it weighed heavily on my mind. And I think Marvy knew that. And there I was when I had a one month old child and I, and, and we had this discussion about me going back. And I said, well, I'm really going to try not to push the boundaries and sort of approach it in the same way. A photographer who's really influential on my work when I was a conflict photographer was, uh, Joaquin Leidenfog, who's, um, seven who did this amazing book in the late nineties, uh, called Albanians, late nineties, early two thousands. And, um, it was really influential. There's no violence in the book, but it is about the, uh, the war in Albania. Uh, and I was like, that's how I'm going to approach this situation. I went back and I tried, but, um, I didn't do it that way. I found myself pulled by, you know, the violence that I, I was so used to covering and, um, the intensity of those situations and how I worked as a photographer and reacted this really to those intense situations. I'm not a quiet person and, and, and it, it, I, that, that doesn't come through in my images either. Uh, and there was a day when, uh, in Libya, in uh, Tripoli in, in Gaddafi's compound where I was in the most intense gun battle of my life. And I was on the third floor of a building running, up the stairs with Ron Haviv and Yuri Kozarov. And um, there were three soldiers in front of me. And they were clearing this building. And a sniper uh, on the fifth floor shot straight down. And the man who was running in front of me, his head just exploded. And I kind of kind of went backwards down the stairs, and I'm standing in the stairwell. And I remember standing there. I'm not shaking. I mean, it wasn't very good light. And I was just watching this blood was so red, like the reddest you'd ever seen. It's just, and I just mesmerized as I kind of flowed down the stairs and Ron tapped me on the shoulder and he's like, Ben, we're like the last guys in this, like everyone just ran. And so we started running out we run down the stairs and grenades started flying over our head as we left the building. Like literally grenades flew over our heads um, as we went from the, out of the door of this building and ran for cover. And, uh, I mean, more of that for like the next two hours of just nonstop. And, um, I sat on those pictures for a while because I knew I had broken a promise to Marvy that I wouldn't put myself into this kind of situation. I left Libya about a month later and I went to uh, Afghanistan, straight to Afghanistan on assignment um, for the New York Times Magazine. And I was doing a story on like Afghans at leisure, like all the different sports Afghan play. It was, it was, it's much more, it was much more gentle, I guess would be the word story. And, uh, I think I was frustrated that I had these intense images of war and I was sitting on it because in the, in the midst of doing this non-intense story, I was thinking, and this maybe is a little bit of PTSD or the situation I found myself in where I was so at rest in Afghanistan on this quiet assignment that I um, looked back at the stuff in Libya. And so I transmitted it one night and Marvy must have gotten Google alerts or something when those images hit Getty. Uh, and she called me. My New York uh, cell phone still worked in Afghanistan. It's about five ninety nine a minute on AT&T. And uh, it was like four in the morning my time. And she let me have it for a good, good two hours. It's a $4,000 phone bill. Um, about how it's like I cheated on her, but with war and I broke my promise and she was going to leave me. And because I didn't really care about being a husband or a father. Um, and it really, I sat in Afghanistan and listened to her and realized that it was time to make a choice about where my life was going and what I was doing and the reasons why I was doing it. And I, I, I really think of that phone call um, in all its brutal honesty from Marvy and really one, one of the few times where, you know, that I can count on, our, on my hand that our marriage was in serious trouble, that I, it was a watershed event for me about, you know, how I was going to 
change and not do this in the right. same way anymore. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I ask you, when you made that call, you're home, you have a newborn, was it a fear for him, a fear for your relationship, a fear for the children's and the future? Or was there also what, something we talked about earlier, this, this idea that he's over there doing this and as dangerous and horrible as it is, it's, it's what he wants to do and it's exciting and you're here or back at, at home not doing it. Was there, was there resentment also at that moment? No, no. I mean, because I really did understand the motivation for going there. And as a matter of fact, I supported it because I knew that um, he emotionally needed to kind of, I, I, I suppose it was part of the healing process. I, it, to complete the it, experience. It, it, it was part of the process to, to go back to Libya and finish that story for him. Um, so I understand, I understood that. I think what I didn't understand was the betrayal. And, and a lot of it too has to do with the fact that one, he had all of these, you know, like emotional, mental um, conflicts that, that he hadn't really dealt with after the death of uh, the two photographers that we had known. Um, so he hadn't, I, and I understood that. I understood that he, this was just a process that he needed to go to. I understood that. Um, but what I really didn't get at that time, just now that I think about it, now looking back, he didn't have the same relationship with the kids that he has now. I mean, they were babies. They mm -hmm. weren't talking. Caleb was just born. He was essentially just this blob, right? He can say that, yeah, that's my son and I'm the father and I love him. But, you know, as with every human relationship, the more you get to know them, the deeper that relationship is. So there wasn't that type of bond yet. He loved his kids. That was no, that's, that's a given. But he hadn't talked to them there. Their personalities weren't there yet. So I think that contributed to, to the ease of, of uh, I guess, breaking that that promise. Mm. And so I felt like it was a betrayal. Um, because you had specifically sp spoken about this. Right. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I, again, and this was me, you know, I, I, again, like seeing different scenarios. Like I saw Mateo as five and then Ben interacting with Matei when he would be five and knowing that relationship. And for me, it was like, you were okay with the possibility of not having that bond with your child when they're older because you were willing to leave them when they were one and a half um, and putting yourself in this, in this situation that was very dangerous and could have been um, fatal. Um, so that was to me what the betrayal was I resentment didn't even I, I I wasn't I was in such a fog taking care of two kids under two mm -hmm. that that didn't even occur to me at that time it was well, just I, really I ask you a question though like if you're going to places like Libya and Afghanistan at that time isn't it sort of expected that the unexpected is going to happen anytime any sure place? sure I understand that but you also realize that you can make uh, logistical choices uh, where you're not mm -hmm. going after. Oh, you're not going to say, hey, there's the gunfire. I'm going to go oh, run to that Let's gunfire. Let's see what all the noise is yeah, about. I yeah, mean, you I mean, know, there, you were, know. There, were, there were a couple of moments in my career uh, before kids where I called Marvy. Uh, she didn't know, but I called her because I thought I was going to die. And I just wanted to say, hey, um, and goodbye. Uh, and, and did you have that feeling when you were in this last situation, though, in that stairwell? Did that no. cross your mind? Did you go there saying, "I'm cheating right now"? Was that in your head at all, or was you? Are you just in the moment? That was in the moment. Uh, you know, there there are situations when you're stuck in a, in a conflict zone, but there's a, a, a period of rest uh, where it's not intense, where you can reflect. Uh, there was a moment where I was uh, stuck in. Um, or cook after a suicide bombing where I really thought I was gonna gonna die, and um, and I and and I called Marvy to be like, oh hey, hun, I just wanted to say hey uh, before I was like smuggled out of town in the trunk of a car, 
you know, and, and there, there were a couple of those moments in my career where I did make that, that choice, uh, that she didn't know. Um, but you know, it, and in that particular moment, no, there wasn't, um, because it was so intense. There was no moment to reflect. I think w- where it came from more is that I really defined myself for many years, for a decade as a conflict photographer. This is what I do. This is where I shine, where I'm able to keep my head in the thick of it and think photographically and think contextually about what I'm seeing and how to show that to people. Um, that was so important to me. I mean, I'm, my father was born in a concentration camp um, and that really affected the way I grew up, the way he grew up. And from a very early age, I was really aware of the world and what it meant uh, to have the privilege of that awareness and, and the burden. And when I became a photographer, it was very specifically to be a conflict photographer. I, I wasn't in love with the camera because it can make images, but I knew that I wanted to report from these spaces. Um, and it's very hard for me to look back with the maturity that age brings and understand why that was all the, all the motivations behind why that was, but that, you know, and that'll take years of reflection. Like, why did I specifically want to just do this and nothing else? Um, but that was how I defined myself. Um, and, uh, I think it was very hard to strip that definition of being away to something else. Um, and, Marriage wasn't enough to do that, but parenthood was. Yeah, because a partner doesn't necessarily cha- change your perspective in life. Um, but you also fell in love with me and married me when I was in that space. I fell in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> and thus it begins. <laughs> Let's keep on believing that. No, no, no. But, you know, a partner doesn't necessarily change your perspective and your identity, but children, children will. Absolutely. And we've actually talked about, will I ever go back and, and do it? Because I, I do have this, like, intense feeling of shame, let's say, for not covering something as important as Syria or um, the battle for Mosul, in this, just in the sense that... Shame or guilt? But, well, both. I, I, you know, good both. Question. <laughs> the shame... And the guilt are, are, are synonymous in the sense that I don't think I'd make more people care. I don't think that was ever it. It's that you just bring more evidence of what we do. And, and, yeah, and but that, you bring, the, the, but you that, know, that there's, has, a, there's, a, there's a level of arrogance there thinking that it has no, to No, the come arrogance from is you. that I think it's, yes, I, I agree. I, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I mean, my images are ever going to change the world. I just think I want to add to the, discussion and awareness and see those things with my own eyes. And, um, I felt very guilty not covering that stuff. And instead, you know, doing the things that I was doing to, you know, make pay the bills. But I think a lot of that is informed by the fact that you are a son of a Holocaust survivor. I I, I don't necessarily, Mm -hmm. you know, and you have to keep that into context that, whether that's it's shame or it's guilt, whatever the feeling is, uh, a well, lot of that is, is... You have an obligation is, to be a witness is what it sounds like. Yeah. And, and that's right because, uh, you know, again, it's about your past, right? Like no. I, I became a photographer because this is what I wanted to do. And and so now it, it, it's like a different scenario for me. Um, and that's okay, but I'm saying it's still something that, that I that I that I deal with. I wouldn't use the word shame or guilt, but the restlessness for me is finding myself in a space right now where I don't feel like I'm contributing or making a dent. Um, mm-hmm. Because for a long time, I have considered journalism as you know being a part of the community that is making a dent, um, that is contributing to a shift or a, a change in the world. Right. Um, and and with advertising, you don't you don't you know, <laughs> you're making a dent in your uh, pocket. Mm-hmm. It's having the maturity and the ability to really step back and understand that these are just phases and that 
one thing doesn't necessarily define you. I can volunteer even though I'm right now mom. I can still volunteer or I can, you know, teach my children about the world. Um, I can create these stories that really resonate emotionally with other people. I remember when I did my story on, on, you know, on depression, someone at a restaurant in Australia came up to me and they said, are you Marvie Lacar? Um, I just saw your exhibit and I just want to say I never understood what it, what people meant when they said that it changed my li- their lives, but that work changed my life. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, what happened? He said, I realized that that was what I was going through. And so I never really understood how much of my own, like, own art or own self-expression about my own journey could affect other people's lives. And so a lot of that is just really realizing that your contribution doesn't have to just be conflict photography. It doesn't even have to be photography or journalism. There's so many ways to make a dent um, without boxing yourself and your purpose into just this one specific thing. I think there was an assignment that I had in Iceland um, about two years ago, mm-hmm. um, which was sort of the beginning of this. We didn't know, but it was the beginning of this transition that we were going to be making into sort of, at least on the editorial side, to this like adventure underwater stuff. And um, was that how, how how conscious of a decision was that? It was something just kind of. It was of not. Evolving. It was not conscious. It was okay. just a normal assignment, and. Um, at one point, I stayed some extra time in Iceland because I heard it was cool. And it seems like there are more New Yorkers and Icelanders than <laughs> in, in Iceland. Um, and uh, at one point, I, I just left my cameras in the car and went from for this like epic hike on my own. You know, just a bag with the same. I just you know why not? Of course, my cell phone still worked, and Marvy called me, and we had a conversation. He said, "You know what, Ben? You sound." So happy. So happy. He sounded so light. And I realized that like, wow, like I had a reflection right there. I was like, I, I'm not even making an image. I'm just like walking. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, I actually really enjoy this. And then I had a, an assignment that I hadn't scuba dived since I was 15. And it was about a month later that, of, from this Iceland trip. And you know, I was scuba diving and I was like, and we spoke on the phone again. She was like, you sound happy. I was like, well, yeah, I was just swimming with sharks and I didn't even know I knew how to do that. Um, and, you know, it just kind of went from there where I realized that doing the, the conflict work fulfilled a couple of different parts of of me, of my soul. But when I've been doing this this underwater stuff where I'm pushing myself physically to a limit there's an interaction that is so different than when you're photographing people because a whale shark a great white sea lion they don't care about if you're a republican if you're a democrat if you support isis or al-qaeda or nato or what your feelings are on tax reform, okay. right? They just feel your beating heart. And I literally mean it. Like there, there was uh, a couple of months ago, I swam with hammerheads. And the reason hammerheads look like a hammerhead is because their nose is packed full of nerve endings that, uh, that can sense electrical stimulation all around them. And they usually feed off of animals, critters hiding you know, in, in the seabed floor. Um, and they can sense their heartbeat. And they won't get close to a human being if your heart's going crazy, if you're nervous. Because that means that, you know, you, that the, the prey, me, knows that this creature is close and it's just going to go away. You're calm. If you're calm, you're not going all over the place. You're not wrestling around in the sea playing with your camera, making waves, making bubbles, they'll swarm around you. And that's how you make good images. 
And that is amazing to me that that interaction was so pure and visceral and I was happy. And I never had that with anything I'd been doing before. You had started talking a bit about your project uh, 1 in 20. The, yeah, I the, wanted to get back to yes. You had mentioned or I read that uh, Ben encouraged you to document and, and, and go forward with this. So obviously there's some collaboration there and some support on that end. Do you want to can you talk about about that and how you work together on that, or has it become just your thing? Yeah, I mean, obviously Ben was involved. I, I mean, it 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 evolved over a very long period of time. In 2008, my dad died, and I had this very um, dark emotional dip. I hit a long stretch of um, depression, clinical depression, where I was actually in the hospital and and on medication and all that. Um, and I had stopped photographing, and I had stopped talking, actually, for a while. Uh, I was lost in my head. And at one point, Ben said that maybe maybe this is another way for you to just examine what you're going through by photographing. That way you don't have to spend energy trying to create words in your mouth because the act, that physical act of talking was so exhausting for me. And I just stopped doing that. I wrote a lot too um, in my journal. And so it just started from there. And it actually helped me process that whole year because I was able to take those feelings, transfer them onto a, a, a photographic paper and look at it as if I wasn't the person going through it and study. Like, I like studying things. And so it, I was able to study those emotions that are inside of me. And since I'm a very visual person, and study them visually. And it allowed me to understand what I was going through in a way that I wouldn't have been able to. I, I need to see things to be able to understand it. And for me, I, I had to see that experience so I had to see myself mm -hmm. photograph it and transfer it onto a piece of paper and look at it and look at the writings and, and really read and reread what was going on in my head. And so for me, that was a, um, that was a healing process. And what, I, what I found out towards the end of that year and when I started sharing it with other people was how much that story resonated with people and Did how... You Ben first? I or? share, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I shared it with Ben first, and it was supposed to be for me and Ben. Mm -hmm. And then I shared it with my therapy group, and then everyone just had such a visceral reaction to it. Um, and then I started sharing it with editors, and for, and it was one of those things where, and I'd never had that reaction with any other project that I've had where people would just sit down, cry, tell me about their stories. I mean, I would just have random strangers just tell me their life stories and it was cathartic for them as well as helpful for me it was healing for me because I, I realized that what I was going through I wasn't an anomaly Can you tell us what one in 20 stands for for those who are not sure um for every uh 20 people that try to end their life one person actually takes it to the end so so that's that's how that that evolved and you know the, the, a bunch of people came on board to to work on that and it became a group instead of just my own project um we had carrie Payne, um ben deb pang davis and then syracuse university decided to sponsor us and help us with our website and our branding um I would say that it has been on a hiatus right now because, again, Ben and I, are, because this is such a personal project on everyone's part and we're doing other things on the business, it's, you know, it's been on, um, it's been on, on a break, but it will be there for people to see. That's one in 20 in short. And the it's reason just a collaboration of people who decided mm -hmm. that they wanted to help with, with destigmatizing um, I think one of, the, one of the big reasons why one in 20 works. Um, it's probably the same reason why our marriage works. I mean, Marvie's work was so brutally honest and like really visceral. And that's why people reacted to it because it was more honest than they could be with themselves. And that's how she is with me. 
in, in many ways in all aspects of our, in our relationship. Um, and, um, that's, that's kind of Marvy in a nutshell. And that, and that's why um, we and she are, are so successful. Woo. You know, sometimes you come into the studio, not really knowing where the show is going to go. And today I came in we had a list of questions. We had some. No, 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 I'm going to answer it. <laughs> no. <I> just, <laughs> <laughs> John just shredded his script. I, I have to go on record saying this. Although is we did touch on a lot of this we stuff. We did. Oh, yeah. This has been one of the more incredible episodes we've done. We've covered a lot of things. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Marvy. You can find more of Marvy's work at marvilacar.co. That's M A R V I L A C A R dot. CO. CO. And for more of Ben's work, uh, lowyimages.com. Does that take us any place interesting too? Or well, is that actually just your site? You have three uh, places to choose at lowyimages.com. You can go to editorial, which redirects to benlowy.com. Ah. Uh, and you have our advertising work, which we've worked on together. Uh, and then we have our motion work, which is the TV commercials that we've done and stuff like that, which is, you know, um, some awesome stuff. All right, they're going to turn the lights out on us here. Uh, <laughs> on behalf of John Harris, Jason Tables, and myself, and thanks to uh, Ben and Marvy again, my name is Alan Whites, and thank you so much for tuning in today. 